Welcome to the Directions Mag Geo Inspirations podcast series with Joseph Kursky. Well, greetings all. Joseph Kursky here, your host in the Geo Inspirations series with Directions Magazine. The Geo Inspiration series. As the name implies, we've got some really inspiring people on this series. And today is no exception because I've got my friend and colleague, Andres Abeta, here. And Andres, I think a lot of people in the geospatial industry know who you are, but welcome. And if you could explain a little bit about where you work and then a little bit about your journey to where you are. Thanks, Joseph. It's really awesome to be here. I appreciate your whole Geo Inspiration series. Um, I'm honored to be one of the guests. Um, my current title is CEO of Bootcamp GIS, which is a subject matter expert driven education platform. So that's um, quite a bit different than other authored education that uh, typically is institution driven. Um, this is much more learning from your peers who have figured it out before you. I like that. Uh, learning from the peers. We'll, we'll pick that apart here in today's session a bit more. Okay. How did you journey to Bootcamp GIS and your, your consultancy? That's such a great question. I, I ask that question all the time in my classes or when I, I, I interview someone else. I recently saw your uh, Why Study Geography. I think that was the... Um, mm the video mm -hmm. that you put together and all of those were great reasons why it's really an, a wonderful industry to get into. I identified with all of them being able to travel and uh, meet different people, work in commercial sector as well as government and nonprofit and so forth. I've kind of encompassed a lot of that. That's why I brought it up. And I've got three different backgrounds. Um, I've got my degrees in geography, you know, an undergrad and, and a master's. So I I'm the minority like you who actually studied geography and now doing it. <laughs> Most people I talk to uh, don't have a degree in it and then just, you know, found a love for it and got in. Mm -hmm. um, the other couple of things. So I got a master's degree in education as well. So I taught middle school, high school, college. But the most recent thing that has kind of formed my my path and, and way of thinking is a, a tour through the ed tech community. Really not geospatial specific. It's just the evolving innovative space and ed tech that's affecting all types of education. And um, there I got to rub shoulders with a lot of other innovators that had ideas of how we could make education more accessible, easy to use, um, help institutions run their educational programs better, just solving lots of problems. So it's really a threefold background there. And I've worked with some of those wonderful institutions that you've been a part of in the past. San Diego State, they've got that master's in uh, business analytics slash data science program over there. And then UNM, good people over there, just south of me from here in Colorado, uh, New Mexico. You know, it's really interesting. You're very immersed in the technology, but you've got this education background practically with teaching middle and high school, which we could have a whole conversation about how is that the same? How is that different from teaching adults? And then your foundation of education with your education degree. I think that probably lends a lot to your approach, right? When you're working with the, with the professional community and nudging them forward in geotechnologies and other technologies, how does that inform, you know, some of the day-to-day -day planning that you do for your curricular offerings and that sort of thing, your, your educational background that you've got? You know, I, I think it starts with listening to students because I've gotten to interact with a lot of students uh, at different levels. And mm -hmm. anything that I design, um, I talk to students first. And, and I get uh, into these high-level webinars and conferences um, with other people in, in education and tech. And I don't hear that as much. I, I hear people who are making decisions on behalf of a university or a continuing education department or a geography department. And it's pretty rare that I hear them say, you know, I talk to our students and they would like X, mm. Y, Z. Um, and I ask my question, myself that question all the time because, you know, you when you're a teacher like you and I are and you're interacting with students, you learn as much from them as, as they from you in a lot of ways. And so I try to take mm -hmm. that to heart and bring that into my, my thought process of what we're developing that's good for them because they're, I see their, their positions as a marginalized community or uh, not having access to 
uh, a type of curriculum in Ocean's GIS because they live in Iowa. I mean, all these different things that uh, make me think, how can I make this better, more accessible? And, um, and that's probably, you know, the thing that uh, drives my way of thinking that could be a little bit different than others. I'm trying to remember in my undergraduate or graduate school experiences, I don't think I was ever asked those kinds of questions from teaching assistants, professors, not that they weren't listening, but I, I really like the idea of even a student advisory board, right, for your own department or your university. I know they exist. Um, I was never on one. I was never aware of one. And there's so many good things about that, especially with the rapid pace of technological, educational, societal change, whether it's in geotechnology or any other field, I would think that that sort of dialogue between faculty, deans, provosts, and students would be even more important as universities are grappling with not just the latest year and a half worth of um, COVID-inspired change or COVID-caused change and disruption, but just how, how should our department, university, institution, community college, tribal college, technical college, whatever it is, position itself so that we can get to the end of the decade thriving and serving students' needs and, and so on. I, I really like what you're saying. I'm hopefully, hopefully this, this, um, this conversation right here is inspiring people to think about, you know, maybe I should try that. Maybe I should try some sort of student advisory board or at least at, at the very least, talk to my students on a regular basis about what their expectations are, what their needs are. And it might, it might take a while, right, Andres? Because students are not used to being asked that. It, even in the courses, perhaps that you, you can relate as well, I ask students to reflect on their own learning. I know this is central to what you do as well, which is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of yours. But oftentimes they can't say something right away, but I give them time to reflect on it, maybe a day, a couple days, because they're, I think in part, they're not used to being asked that question to reflect even on their own learning. What was most meaningful about this last activity? They're just, they're so used to just cranking out the answers and going through workflows, right, in most of their courses. Not that that's a bad thing, but I really like what you're digging into here about getting student input. Yeah, I give these presentations um, to student groups. I purposely go to a Texas state, a, a, a um, UC Riverside, a San Diego State, and I find the Geographic Society or um, some geographic student organization, and I want to give them a presentation. I want to tell them about really a lot of things I'm going to speak about today and say, here's, here's a view that you should probably know about from somebody in education and, uh, and geography and been through it a bunch of years. But when after I say these things, I want to hear, what do you think about that? So I get positive feedback because I think it's uh, an innovative um uh, perspective, but the neat thing about it is they they have a voice, they have a strong opinions about what their current education is giving them or not giving them, and education is one of those areas that's been insulated from like the commercial sector, which has to behave with this feedback mechanism. Yelp, uh, all 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 applications, apps that have rating systems of consumers. And if you don't react to those consumers, then your app or your business goes downhill because people are reading that stuff. With schools, they've been insulated because, you know, you, you go and you, you take this state university education that's nearby and that's what I can afford. And, um, and then you're in. But uh, there's new signs of trends where they're starting to react and become um, a lot more partnered with uh, people like us, content developers in industry, and and that's that's a reaction to the industry and what students are seeing that they can learn in so many different ways. Why not partner together with uh, some of these other sources of education? Mm -hmm. Good points. And on a, on a related note, it seems that students at all levels, let's just focus on the higher education for the moment, but they are increasingly aware that it's up to them to chart their pathway um, and, and seek additional ways of learning that may not be at their, quote, home institution, right? So as their students in university or college X, they can take a MOOC. They can take additional training on the side. I know you and I always encourage students to ask questions that their professor's not asking. 
because in part, when they get to the workplace, we want them to ask questions that their supervisor is not even asking them. In other words, digging deeper and asking those deep questions is what every organization, right, nonprofit, private industry, government agency wants their employees to do is really to, to think big and ask insightful questions that hmm, we never thought about that before. Good point. Maybe we should investigate that. But circling back to the students, yeah, taking charge of their own learning. And you can kind of see it in various options for students nowadays, right? Certificate programs of various kinds, micro credentials. And, you know, we can pick that apart a bit too, but it's, I think it's a good thing. It, it, it And it's still something that you and I are sort of blowing on the embers and trying to make them flame up. Uh, but but the whole idea of individuals being in charge of their own learning pathway and also realizing that it's not going to end when they graduate with X degree or X credential or certificate, right? It, it's, it's an ongoing thing, no matter what field you're in, geotechnologies or otherwise. I think you read an article that I wrote it's called uh, Spotification of Your Education. Indeed. What, you just, mm-hmm. what you just said is so true. And and kids are living this. I say the kids, the uh, current college students, they're living this, but they may not be consciously proactively thinking about this in terms of their own uh, career pathway, their own branding, um, how they learn. You know, I, I have a senior uh, daughter in high school. Mm-hmm. And right now there's this focused three or four months where mom and dad and daughter are are trying to make decisions about your education. You go visit schools, you write all these essays, uh, you talk to people at these schools and maybe friends that have gone to to these different places as alumni. Um, You watch a ton of videos now with YouTube and then you make a decision. So it's just like really focused time. You're in this institution and you're more passive. You're just saying, well, um, another semester, I'll pick some classes and the university will kind of guide me to a degree, right? My thesis here is don't, give up that proactive sensibility of picking your education after you're into the institution, because Mm -hmm. you're going to have to continue to be proactive, especially in tech, which is evolving so quickly. I want you to not think about uh, school as almost the vinyl LP record. You know, before we used to, we were turned on by a couple of songs and we bought a record and we liked those two songs, but the rest of the eight were kind of (laughs) crappy. And that's what, sometimes a degree can be is you go in and you talk to students and they'll say, yeah, I had a couple of good classes and I had eight crappy classes, you know, this past year. So the responsibility is upon that student to say, well, don't just limit your education to those classes within the semester. Like you said, go out and learn from a MOOC, um, find some other thought leaders, connect with them on LinkedIn, take some of the virtual education that's offered like the UC this year and then see what other people are are doing great things and watching from video, just keep it streaming into you. And if you do that, you stay ahead of the game because you can prove, you can learn and, and know what's, uh, what are good solutions and how tech is impacting those, um, in your field. Indeed. You know, aligned with what you're saying is a couple of links that you sent me that I want to share with the readers. And one of, one of those was reality changers. I thought that was really quite interesting. Do you want to mention what reality changers.org is a little bit for the listener? Yeah. So I'm, I'm based in San Diego and there's a student prep um, college prep organization called Re- reality changers nonprofit. But what they do is they recognize that high school students that are at risk of falling out of high school or not going to college, um, they need help starting in middle school to kind of change that pathway. And so In the tougher part of San Diego, Southeast San Diego, they bring students um, through this program starting in eighth grade and they start giving them mentoring and guidance and uh, tutoring. Um, So there's programs like this around the country. This one I love, it's so successful because they bring these kids forward uh, to the point of graduating high school and you can go to their website and the the video that's top most on on their site is just the director, handing out a sweatshirt to each of these universities that they're going to, Cal Poly, MIT, Loyola Marymount, name the university, they got kids in there. And so this was a function of a lot of hard work by people and and driving this pathway to success for all of them. Um, Amazing. So we're part of that. 
And I like to uh, offer our mentorship because, um, you know, a lot of these kids, most kids wouldn't know that a geography career can be gainful, interesting, meaningful. And um, that's what I try to pass to them. Well, I appreciate all that you do. You're, you're a great example of, I think it runs throughout the geospatial and geography and viro geoscience community, giving back to the community. And we really care about future generations coming into the field. And as you touched on earlier, you and I coming from geo geography backgrounds, that is still important in the, in, in the geospatial technology field. But now you've got in part because of web GIS and all of these, you know, tools and, and GIS being more embedded in mainstream IT, so connected to uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other IT sort of trends, that you've got a we've got a, a widening diversity of people in in this industry, which is which is great. It's exactly what we need to solve these complex 21st century issues, right, Andres? But coming back to these students, um, that's one of the reasons why. I know you and I love working with geotechnologies. It's not just the geotechnologies. Yeah, the tools are interesting. The data is fascinating. And yeah, there's lots of problems to solve. But it's inspiring, as the realitychangers.org site says, students and future folks in the workplace to be change agents, right? That's really the goal is to make them, help them, enable them, empower them to be change agents in government, business, nonprofit, academia, wherever they end up working, right? That's the goal is, is to, to inspire these change agents, right? And so, yeah, I, I love that. And I love what you're saying. That's one of the reasons why I also keep going back to when we're working with students in geotechnologies, for example, those students at Roosevelt High School, for example, in East LA and other students that, that we've highlighted over the years, whether that's been on the UC plenary stage or in an article or something like that, showing people that, you know, you don't have to be some sort of special high school or middle school or even primary school to be doing this kind of thing, to get out there in the field in your community and, and to look at what's happening and, hey, is there something I'm interested in in the community or something of concern in my community? No matter what kind of school they're in, uh, rural, urban, et cetera, large, small, they can do this. And, and so how can we inspire them to, to, to embrace some of these tools to show them that, yes, you have the ability to be a change agent, no matter what age you are, you don't have to wait till you're graduated to actually make a difference in your community. Yeah, that's uh, so true. And, and Esri has been so awesome about that with their grants for software and K through 12 program. Um, I think that arming schools with the advisors like us or mentors in, in that capacity is a really good thing. But the thing I think is a little bit missing is once they come out of school and they might have done a, cl- a project or, or two in, in high school, for instance, then where can that be um, a career pathway that's described to them as either a geography degree or let's say it's environmental science or math. I mean, there's, you can get a lot of different degrees and then, you know, it's that add on piece of education. They can say, yeah, I like that thing that I did in high school and I still want to visualize data in that way and, and present to decision makers to make better decisions. Um, I want to hang on to that. Where else can I still get that piece of education in addition to my, my statistics degree? Um, we need to give more um, channels to do that. Uh, that's one of the things that we offer. Indeed. Well, thanks for the kind words about Esri, but we're all in this together. We are, that's why it's great to be working with you and, and others. It is a community. And if we're going to nudge this whole needle of, of geoliteracy forward, we've got to be working together, right? There are just too many, it, it's just too important not to do this. It, it's too, we've got too many issues happening in our communities globally. I mean, energy, water, climate, social injustice. I mean, good grief. I mean, we we could spend the whole time talking about these issues. We just can't wait around. We've got to do it. Uh, So, and if we don't, who who will really, who has the, the educational and the technological background other than this geotechnology education community uh, to, to get, 
to, to get this done. Now, certainly partnering with many organizations is going to help get it done. Uh, but anyway, thanks for the kind words. But it is, it is a, it is a global community, and I'm very encouraged by, by the progress made. Sometimes you and I want things to happen a little bit faster than they are. But the bottom line, though, is that students are, they've got options. Educators have options to, like the site that you shared, the tools at, at their fingertips, the you know, in the old, not too distant past, right? You'd get done with these educator professional development institutes and then they'd realize, oh, I have to install software. I have to get a lab that's really high end, et cetera, et cetera. There were all these tech barriers, not to say that there's not barriers now, but they're more of a pedagogical, educational kind of challenges. Like how do I fit this into my curriculum? How do I, do I start a geotech club after school? How do I do that? Uh, and then how do I, you know, another question too that we could we could start grappling with is when students get excited, let's say they're in this reality changers and they start working with these some of these tools in middle and high school, then they go to university. How do they continue it? You know, I, I really worry about students that, you know, get on a roll with some of this and then they go to an institution or maybe their teacher that's a champion leaves, goes elsewhere. It's like learning a, a language, right? You get so far with the Espanol or Portuguese or something and then and then you stop for a year and then, uh oh, I've got to start completely over now almost. Yeah, that's right. Sustained uh, education. That's why this idea of thinking um, it's not your institution that is entirely responsible for your education. It's you. So you got to give them some alternatives. Um, so more content providers like us are going to spring up and offer other types of uh, avenues to keep learning, stay in contact with professionals. And that's a good thing. And what do you think, Andres, that we really need to be grappling with and working on? You know, here it is at the time of this recording, mid-2021, you know, thinking maybe 2025 or 2030, where do we need to, what needs to happen to get us to a point in society where people are aware of these capabilities, they're empowered, they're confident that they can do it no matter, no matter what profession they're in or no matter what age level or background they might have. Where, what do you think we need to be doing? It's an ev evolution of the current education structures. It's already happening. Um, and it's happened a lot faster even now with COVID uh, in place. So before COVID, we went to high school, maybe went to college, and you took these programs that these institutions told us, uh, hey, in four years, you're going to get a degree in or high school diploma. And then maybe in four years, you're going to get a, high, a college degree. And those, those are the chunks of education. COVID has now forced all of our eyes wide open as parents watching our kids learn <laughs> to students themselves being subject to limited um, educational delivery by these institutions saying, where else can I learn things? That's the start of it. Now, universities, for instance, have said, okay, now coming back after COVID, how are we going to bring that audience back and be connected to us at, at, uh, uh, showing value um, in their tuitions with us, they're going to have to evolve very quickly. And, and the trend is to partner with people who can make education that's more modern, faster, more applied than they can. I've been told by university professors, it takes them about two years to get a, a, a course on the course catalog at a university and another year to market it, get students. Three years later to get a, a tech course is an eternity and the tech has changed. They will never, ever be able to keep up with somebody that does a coding boot camp, a data science boot camp, a, a GIS boot camp like us, because we think of a class and eight weeks later we have it. That's the really cool thing that I, I like about what I do is I think about an oceans plastics uh, class uh, applying GIS to that problem. I just got to go and find the person and we make the class. So it's really liberating in that way. And I know mm -hmm. This is something that's a compelling problem. It's education and an application of GIS that, that students will be drawn to. Um, so these partnerships are happening, and you're going to see that almost in every university, if you go to continuing ed, you see lots of certificate programs uh, offered there. And they're not taught by tenured professors often. I would say uh, the increase in content developers from the private side, like a Coursera, 
um, or um, to you that has coding boot camps, you're going to see them at a lot of universities. They're the compliments. They're the trade school compliment to getting the degree. I want my daughter and my son to get mm -hmm. their degree and learn and grow as and think as mature, maturing individuals. But at the same time, I want them to get out of school in four years and then have a marketable skill to get a job so they don't come back and live with me. Right. So um, so this this partnership idea of bringing almost like I think of it as the trade school um, in to be uh, offered as a, a new channel with uh, your degree is going to be suggested and even essential, I think, in tech, because um you know, you can't keep up with it as a tenured professor. It's impossible. Nobody can. So you've got to have more sources and people paying their attention to what's happening to show others this is what you should know. Indeed. Uh, part of your comments reminds me of that. Um, not sure how to pronounce it. Ikigai diagram, the Japanese diagram, where it's, it's got these concentric, well, these, these circles that intersect and sort of like a expanded Venn diagram. And then one of one of the blobs is or zones is what you love, you know, what the world needs, what you're good at, and what you what can you be paid for. And the intersection of all of those is sort of like the ideal. Uh, so it touches on what you were saying before. Sure, uh, when you and I work with environmental science majors, for example, we say oh, it's it's great that you're passionate about the environment. Hopefully, everyone is. We all want to protect it and preserve it and be able to enjoy planet Earth. How can you gain some skills and perspectives that you can take to the EPA or the United Nations Environment Program or your state DNR or whoever it is with some concrete things that they'll actually pay you to do? Because it's, it's, they're not going to pay you to be interested in the environment, right? They're going to pay you because you're going to contribute something to their organization. So to your point about, yeah, you want your own kids and, and the, the, the global community to, to be passionate about aspects of planet Earth but then have the skills that they can contribute in meaningful ways to that organization. Um, and speaking of the organization, you know, one of the things I really admire about you, Andres, is that you're one of the few people that have blazed their own business trail in geospatial education. And so if you could, uh, there's not that many people that have been successful in doing that. It's it's a hard thing. My I, I was sharing you with with you before we started formally chatting here that my own parents ran their own business when I was a kid. Uh, it was a it was a motel. So we lived there. It was one of those where you know you live behind the office. That's where the apartment is. So our whole family lived <laughs> there. My mom was also a school teacher, which is awesome, reflecting on your own background. But I know it was hard. They are never off duty. Uh, we could very seldom go anywhere overnight because, of course, that's when they needed to be there to to help the guests and to be open so the guests could register and so on. So I know it's hard work, even from that, but also working with others, you know, in my adult life. But how did you how did you get there? How, how did you I mean, you mentioned one of the one of the you know maybe secrets to the success is listening to the user's needs. But how did you blaze that? pathway. I mean, you could have, with your background, you could be a university professor full-time. You could be a K through 12 instructor. You could be in a nonprofit. You could be anywhere with, with the background and skills that you've got. How do you, how did you blaze into the, the boot camp GIS? That would be interesting for people to find out how you did it. So I did a lot of courses, designed them for Esri and a lot of the, um, most of the government, government organizations. Um, so I was doing this on my own. Um, with a company that I had founded, it's a small company in education. So I liked that. And I liked that it took me to different places and thinking about problems in each of those, uh, those institutions. And um, I think I found that early on, just intrinsically in me, just having ambition to want to expound upon my ideas. Cause at first, my first job out of college was uh, working for Erdos. So I was, mm -hmm. uh, geography degree doing remote sensing and but I was teaching for them and I, I liked that I like the interpersonal aspect of using tech but still interacting with people love that um, so I would say as a device to people thinking about their careers don't just think about getting a job as a GIS analyst because there's as you mentioned there's ge geospatial is so diverse and where you can apply it you know, you'll be much happier if you find your tribe in doing it for national security or doing it for a dot org or doing it as a commercial and working 
all hours of the night like me, I like doing that. I have no problem being at midnight, you know, working on uh, a document that needs to be doing and, but other people may not. So once you find that pathway, then you can be more predicated and thinking about where I want to have a career and a family and a geographic location. Um, the sooner you do that, the sooner you're going to arrive at your happiness. So for me, I like that idea of, you know, steering my own path. Mm -hmm. I, I will say one more thing to that is that uh, I got accepted into a startup incubator, a couple of them actually, one in San Diego, but the one that uh, really blew my socks off was going to New York. I moved there for three months because I got accepted as one of nine companies in the world that got to go into an ed tech incubator in the, in the nucleus of education and it got exposed in meeting with all of the heavy hitters in education, Macmillan and McGraw-Hill and mm -hmm. uh, Kaplan, I mean, just in investors. And, and being there, it was just like, that was my tribe. I felt kindred spirits with other people who are working their, their tails off at all hours of the night, trying to solve problems in education. And that's one of the things that um, I was drawn to. I knew it right away. Yeah. Thanks for asking that question because uh, that's a good one to think about right away as you're coming out of college, possibly is where will I be happiest? Not just, I want to do GIS. Indeed. I think about the long hours comments of yours, and I didn't fully realize when I was an undergraduate, for example, or especially in primary and secondary, how many hours you would dedicate to your career. And so to the point of, I think in, in, in some ways, you and I and others in the community, we would find a way to do what we're doing, at least part of it, even if we weren't getting paid, right? We are just so passionate about that this is important, this whole idea of spatial literacy and empowering people with geotechnology tools and, and so on. So somehow we would find a way. Yes. But on the other hand, there are the practicalities of, okay, uh, I do like to travel as a geographer, and I'm sure you can relate. That takes money. Okay, <laughs> how do I get that uh, those funds to do it? Um, but I, one of the things that I just wanted to share with, you know, building on your comments, that, you know, advice for people listening to this is that try to pick something that you're very passionate about, as you're very well saying, Andres, because you will spend so many hours in it. Now, my heart goes out to people that are stuck in their position and they're waiting for, you know, five o'clock or whatever closing time is so they can get out of there. Uh, again, that, I've had positions like that as well. Th that's frustrating. And so I don't, I don't want people to think you could just leave. Uh, no, the practicalities are maybe that's the only opportunity in your community right now for you. Okay. But if you're in a position where you're blazing that you're, you're, you're planning your next, your, tr your future trails, try to pick something that you have an intrinsic passion about kind of like your master's thesis, you know, when your advisors say, you know, it, it doesn't matter so much what I think, what are you really interested in? Because that's going to motivate you to keep working at it until you get it done. Kind of like that uh, for your job position, P pick something that you're not going to be constantly watching the clock. And like you said, Andres, if it's, if it's midnight and you need to get something done, you're still motivated to do it uh, because you care about it. And so I think that's, that's an important, uh, uh, element here. Also, I really like your kindred spirits of picking a community or communities. It may be multiple communities that you're that you've got lots of common interests with people. But also, I know you and I uh, are also doing the following: encouraging people to go outside of their comfort zone. You know, so even if it's a small thing like going to a conference. And going to a track for maybe one morning in the not too distant past when it was face to face, going down the hall and go to, going to a different track that's totally outside of your own you know wheelhouse, and you learn some new things. You find out about what they're interested in. You meet some new in, new and interesting people. You know, so encouraging people to kind of branch out out of that you know kindred spirits as well to keep us challenged. I think that's an important part too. So uh, thanks for thanks for touching on that whole you know community as well as reaching out to like you were talking about earlier, um, and encouraging other people to get into this field as well. Yeah, um, so much horizontal uh, mobility that's that you have the capacity to do with our field because it's so diverse. So all you got to do is think about it, learn something in that area, connect with a few people, 
and you never know what's going to be your next opportunity. Indeed. You touched on this a bit, but maybe we could just spend a moment talking about this. The, the needs of the learner, uh, you're very much in touch with the needs of the learner. I mean, you've crafted your whole business around that. We want to come back to what you do specifically day to day in your business, but also um, maybe for right now, how do you see the needs of the learner changing? Yeah. And, and, and are, we, are we meeting those needs? It's a good question. So, you know, everybody's heard of the term student-centered education. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, in tech, it really has moved to very specific learning. You know, we don't want a semester-long class in auto mechanics. <laughs> I just want to go in and, and find the 10-minute video that says, how do I disassemble my entire front grill and my Toyota Acura just to change out the dead <laughs> headlight? That's a common problem. If I get meaningful education like that, I feel very, very validated. So this is the new learner that we're dealing with that says, I don't have time for generalities. College is full of generalities. Yes, go there, get your degree, as I, I said, but you're going to have to find your real specific learning, just like I, I said. And also, you know, you know, you want stuff in real time. You're getting rides, rooms, rigatoni served to us with just a few <laughs> clicks of a button, right? So who, who wants to go through the current structure? I've, I've looked at um, 120 GIS certificate programs around the country, and I see uh, I've written all of their attributes down in, in a survey. And the typical GIS certificate program is one that's built on an old structure that's like apply in March, you'll get a decision in May in which they're going to accept you. Then you're going to start in September with some cohort that's going to go through for six months to a year and a half. And that's not serving me because I don't want to wait six months to get something that I want right now. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to learn how to apply GIS right now. I have the time when I'm, I'm employed or I don't have a, uh, I have some time off that I want to spend learning something. So mm -hmm. the good news is that there's more certificate programs out there, more academic and, and private partnerships who are thinking about this. And um, if you're proactive and you go look at them, there are plenty of other blends of GIS to learn about is how GIS works in the cloud or with data science or with UAV you know, as a data source, things like that. Indeed. And with your statement about that you do listen to the, the user community, it's obvious that you're doing constant research about changing needs. I know you're really humble and you don't want to talk about bootcamp GIS all that much, but, but how did you structure bootcamp GIS and what do you, what do you spend your time doing day to day? Are you actually an instructor in, the own, in your own program? Do you shepherd other instructors? You know, how, how do you structure your days? And what do you offer in your business that helps meet these, these, fill these needs, these gaps that you're identifying? All right. So glad to talk about that. Um, there's this thing called the, the skills gap. People in industry know it. People in education know it. And it's you go to, to college and you learn A, B, C, D, E. And then if you look at job announcements, they're asking for W, X, Y, and Z, some different things. <laughs> that's the gap. And that's, that's your challenge to overcome that, especially coming out of school to say, oh, I think I can learn how to do W, X, Y, Z for you. I haven't done it in college yet, but they have to evaluate whether you, they can hire you based on stuff you haven't done. So a good example is taking classes in intro to cartography, intro to spatial analysis, intro to geodatabase, but you never have really set up a map services on an AWS server. That's what somebody needs in a job to do in a job announcement. And most of the uh, higher paying uh, GIS analyst, uh, analyst jobs out there. So this was the whole inspiration for us building the, uh, the platform. Bootcamp GIS is saying, we need to teach people how to do things that industry is asking for right now. And in a year from now, they're going to be asking for some different things. Can university keep up with that? No, they can't. So we started building classes. And so my job is um, I think about who are experts in industry solving big, compelling problems, because if they are doing that, then that's an industry need and people are going to need more people like them to do that type of work. 
So if you're uh, doing some uh, GIS and renewable energy and you're helping uh, do the analysis of site, a location for a solar farm, that's going to be huge. There's a lot of investment going into renewable energy. Is there a class like that? No, not that I found. And do I uh, want that on my platform? Yes. And that will be one of a hit list of a couple dozen classes that I'm either building or talking to the person that's doing that in industry and saying, I want to take your project, create a short course for the rest of the world to know how to do what it's probably taken you several years to figure out how to do right now. But a lot more people want to be able to do that. So my very interesting path is to talk to a lots of different people doing really awesome GIS and see if they have the time to bring a, a course that we help co-author onto our, our, our platform and, and make that available and accessible to anybody around the world. You know, it's for a fee, but it's actually cheaper than most universities. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When I do that, then I'm really following in the footsteps of people that are my inspirations, like uh, Saul Khan, Khan Academy, making this mm -hmm. you know platform available to, in so many of these academic topics for for kids, or uh, a Linda Weinman, who is the fa founder of uh, Lynda.com, which gets bought okay. by LinkedIn mm -hmm. Learning, and now LinkedIn Learning has all of this business intelligence videos for them and. And then they bought them for a billion and a half dollars. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. Okay. You know, what? one of the things I was wondering about, are all your classes online or do you do any sort of, if an organization wants you and maybe a couple members of your team to go and actually do some face-to-face, -face, do you do that? Or in maybe I should say in normal times, do you actually go face-to-face -face or is it all digital, online, virtual? It's all digital, virtual. Um, it's asynchronous, so you can start and stop anytime that you want to. Um, so I don't hire and have a staff of instructors right here in my office. Um, there's a reason for that. It's because I want the people that are doing the work out in for disaster risk reduction for FEMA. That's the person mm -hmm. you want to learn from, right? You don't want to learn from coding from a 65-year-old professor who's never coded a mobile app. You want to do, learn from the person that does it for a living for Yelp or LinkedIn or, or Google. That's the same principle that, that we offer. So our, all of our stuff is online and you also get uh, remote office hours with the instructor. So you get to get talk Ooh, to them, pick yeah, their brain nice. and find out not only how they apply GIS, but how they got into their industry, got their job. Uh, all the oh, I, lo I love that aspect of it as well. Yeah. Yeah, that is great. Another thing I love about your offerings is that like you said you're 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 touching deeply on what I call, you know, modern GIS. It's web enabled data as services, etc., software as a service GIS. The future of GIS. Well, indeed, we've had it for, you know, it's been evolving, right? But uh, and you and I have seen it evolve and undergo multiple paradigm shifts and but you're really embracing it. In other words, the, the, I just encourage people to, to check out the, the ones that, the offerings that you have, because at the time that this was, is actually published, there'll be, there'll be additional and more diverse courses even than you have at the moment that we're recording this. But, but your how do I make a GIS startup course, your build a dashboard, UAVs, um, AWS, uh, setting up an AWS map service for, for disaster management. I mean, all these things are, like you're, like you're saying, they are what people need now. And you're filling that gap because many folks in geospatial technology, myself included, um, they're, they know that some of these tools and additional capabilities exist. And, you know, we do our best to, to embrace those and take our own, you know, learning pathways forward and, take additional courses and things like that. But at some point you have to decide what are you gonna focus on in the world of geospatial? And for me, um, I know about some of these things, but I don't know how to set up a server. I don't know how to do some of these things that you have on here, but they're important, like you said, and people are, are needing those, those skills in their organization. And they're not gonna get it from someone like me that is in you know spatial analysis and education and that sort of thing. They need they need someone who's taken some of the courses that you've got here. So you're really embracing the uh, this whole notion of GIS for the 2020s and beyond the modern GIS. 
Yeah, the 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 paradigm has shifted, and and the higher education system is going to have to evolve very quickly. So the current paradigm, and I've worked for both academia and government institutions, and their paradigm is the same. It's the one to many distribution of knowledge. I, as an expert at uh, in GIS, go to the National Training Center at the U.S. Forest Service in Salt Lake City, and I say, hey, let me tell you how you use GIS for all you foresters. I'm not a forester, but I contrive some exercises <laughs> and, and I tell them how to do it. And, um, and I can only convey what I know. And not being a forester, that's really tough. So the paradigm, sh- and so that happens for all of the organizations as well as tenured professors. Now, if you look to the new model of education, it's many to many, peer to peer. That's YouTube. You know, I don't care if you don't have a PhD next to your name as the auto mechanic, but you are going to show me that video that I just talked about with changing the headlight. That's cool. Um, So as long as we have many people figuring out things just ahead of us and how to site that solar farm using GIS that you just learned to do over the last year. That's awesome. That's what I want to know. And I know that's marketable because renewable energy is is our future. And so we need more eye on the ball of here's the future. Let's build that course, build that education, make it accessible. And when you have that peer to peer structure in most services, it wins out over the one to many. And so that's where education is going to have to face the face this this change, especially the older institutions. People want that. They want to be part of it. And anybody listening on this call, if you got an idea and you're really good at solar mapping (laughs) of a solar farm, call me because we can build a class together. Uh, I love all these comments and insights that you're sharing. I think one of the things that I just wanted to reflect on is you and I have the honor, really, of working with a wide variety of people, including many, many innovative instructors and students in academia, traditional institutions. And many of them are very forward thinking about geotechnologies and educational theory and all the things that we've touched on uh, here in the call. I think one of the freeing uh, things for those academic instructors who grapple with the rapid pace of change in geo GI science geotechnologies is how can I possibly embrace all of these elements of machine learning, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and IoT, everything else that's going on that are now connected to geospatial technology? How can I possibly teach all of that? Well, I think the 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 freeing moment for them is that you don't have to teach all of these things, but it's good to expose students to some of the things that the, some of the elements that you're immersed in, Andres. But yet knowing that when the time comes for those students to uh, apply for those positions, to get additional training and so on, they'll have your foundations that you've laid in your university courses. And then they've got courses like the ones you're offering to get them to that next level. So in other words, the pressure is a little bit off of of the university professors. They still have a key role. You have a key role in the community. So again, it's, it's... it's like a rising tide floating these boats. These yeah. lots of lots of elements of, of a person's pathway in education are are incredibly relevant. It's not just one thing. Yes, we partner with schools, Joseph, um, and got a list of people that are talking to us from all over the country. It's really fascinating. Um, you, the the model was set before us. Uh, the 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 tenure professor, at sixty five years old, that never coded a line of mobile, <laughs> yet he's in the computer science department at a, a high-end one like a UCSD. He's not capable of leading, leading the way for people to kind of go into that mobile coding industry. So they have to partner with a Coursera or a coding bootcamp like Trilogy and, and offer that to their students. So that's the model before us. And there's a lot of coding bootcamps, a lot of data science bootcamps, but there's only one partnering geospatial bootcamp that's us that really gives us the opportunity to uh, be partners with lots of schools. And so um, it may be through continuing education, but um, like you just mentioned, a professor that teaches, teaches what he teaches can have an additive um, influx of content and knowledge when they partner with us. And so I always say, equate it to, we're like the lab. You teach the general 
uh, class in Intro to Remote Sensing. Here, we're going to show you the specifics with video demos of how to process data from a UAV and use this thing called Drone to Map and some Esri software that's very marketable, a skill set. Use us as the lab. That's the, the, mm -hmm. that's the, the catalog partnership right there. And circling back to that university professor, that person still has a key role. They're, they're laying foundations that the student will, will find valuable uh, and many other things. Uh, also, uh, just a, a note to folks, we're talking about bootcampgis.com. And I encourage people to go there, look at the course offerings and so on. Um, Andres, I know you're, you've got a, a deep background in this and that you've also done a survey on geospatial job announcements. Any insights from that survey that you want to share? I know we're kind of coming to the, the end of our discussion time, but if you want to share anything from that survey, that might be insightful. Yeah, uh, I went and looked at, this is part of assessing the skills gap. What was the uh, geospatial industry asking for versus what people mm -hmm. were looking And then the skills gap exists across all tech. It's not just geospatial. Um, so tech is changing quickly and you got to think about what's what people are asking for. So um, what I found was in the survey is that they were asking not only for ArcGIS, ArcGIS online um, skills, uh, but the blend over the crossover. I think we're all cross trainers when we're in uh, geospatial because it's a tool that we're trying to solve to a lot of prob problems and in interact with other technologies. Mm -hmm. So if you can um, have skills that are in system integration, where you get data and you connect it to other data and financials or you know, asset management, things like that, then that's a good thing. Um, knowing how to collect data from other data sources. We have these things in our pocket that are the data sources with location, the smartphone, the UAVs. Um, those things are not typically taught in most colleges that I found. Um, I think less than 5% of the, of the certificate programs had any type of UAV program. Um, getting into cloud, knowing uh, cloud architecture. And if you've got any skills in setting up map systems and putting up dashboards in the cloud, then you are, that may be the most marketable thing right there. You know, everybody's seen the Johns Hopkins COVID map, the most mm -hmm. consumed map in world history. And you can learn how to do exactly that. Anybody can, uh, but you got to go and seek out how to learn that and practice it. Um, so it's stuff like that that we found on this uh, the survey of job announcements that um, anybody can do. It doesn't have to be me. So I, I surveyed about three or 400 job announcements, but you, as a student coming out of college possibly, just go out and look at Indeed, GS Jobs Clearinghouse, look at 30 job announcements, see what types of skills mm -hmm. that they are asking for. And then you got to really ask yourself, do I have those? And if not, how am I going to learn some mm -hmm. of them? And if you go and start learning some of them, you elevate yourself immensely in your opportunities. It is a team effort with all of us looking at this sort of, you know, GIS, uh, the tea leaves, the crystal ball, whatever we want to call it, to figure out what, what people will need even two or three years down the road is a challenge with the rapid pace of change. But like you said, if you've got some of these skills that – those courses of yours address system architecture. You know, I'm in education and I don't work with a lot of those kinds of folks, but even the people in education, for example, at major universities or even, even community and tribal and technical colleges that have the systems background and they know GIS, they're incredibly valued at their own institution. And nobody else knows how to do it except a small <laughs> team or sometimes just one person at their whole on their whole campus. So they are they're indispensable really on their campus. Um, and they seem to really enjoy what they're doing because they're serving their users and they're, um, they're really, um, they know the technology and they know the potential of it. They're not maybe doing the, the spatial analysis day to day because they can't, they, they, they're, they're the systems uh, folks making everything happen so that people can be successful with geotechnology. So can I, things, can I say, can I say yeah. something just also to add on to that? So yes, those people are indispensable and there's too few of them. So the other part mm -hmm. of my, my, my survey is I just talked to uh, project manager, project managers from all these different organizations. And I say, Hey, how's, how's the talent out there for hiring? And they say, wow, 
it sucks. We can't mm. hire anybody because, uh, as I mentioned, there's a skills gap and people are coming out with a geography degree and are not prepared to do the job that we have, have announced. They, this is a national interest, I think. I think it's of national interest for our country to produce more people that are ready to be geospatial professionals, not just know a piece of software, um, but know how to really implement and integrate. And if you can do that, then, you know, the world's your oyster because you're going to have a lot of different opportunities. And these project managers say, if you keep going, Andres, if you can create another hundred solution architects, I'm going to start hiring from you as soon as you can, because there is no uh, geography program that produces a solution architect solutions, which Mm -hmm. is architecting workflows and, and integration of data and systems. Yeah, extremely good point. Certainly the awareness of the value of, maybe people don't even call it geospatial technologies, but you referred to the COVID dashboard. Bill Nye interviewed Jack Dangerman and Catherine Sullivan, and Jack mentioned the COVID JHU dashboard has been viewed two trillion times now. So like you said, the most popular unfortunately, but it was for a good reason. People needed to use it and they still need to use it to make daily decisions and communities need to use it to to set policies and so on and so forth. But at least the awareness of, oh, these dashboards, these maps that Andres and Joseph had been talking about for years, is that what you guys are talking about? Is that what you mean? Oh, I get it now, at least in part. So the awareness is at maybe an all-time high in our career, but they don't always connect it to, okay, like you said, how can I actually get a career? Is this a a thing. This is a a career option. Uh, And and I think another nice message for the listener is that, you know, thinking about the background, even of just you and I talking about here, we've been in lots of different sectors of society. And so I think the message for folks is you are marketable in lots of different areas, disciplines, health, public safety, right? Natural hazards, business, engineering, et cetera, but also in different sectors, nonprofit, academia, private industry, um, government. So You've got a lot of options, and as you your pathway and mine have shown, you can you can change. You're not stuck with one pathway even. So I think that's those are all encouraging messages that you know for the for the listener here. Okay, Andres, we're 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 rapidly sadly running out of time. One of the things that you sent me though was that your two gratifying passions are to help students discover a meaningful career without going broke, which I love the way you phrase that, <laughs> and number two to throw flies at rising trout in scenic places. <laughs> so reflecting your love of the outdoors, maybe maybe someone who's into fishing can't reveal this, but what is one of your favorite scenic places? I can't pick a single one, but the, the, the rising trout thing, the cool thing about that is, you know, you get to disconnect and you're just so in tune with nature and mm-hmm. you're trying to uh, throw a, a fly and be so replicative of how nature works. And even though there's millions of these same little bugs floating through the water, you know, maybe they'll bite mine. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> most of the time they don't. <laughs> and so I love standing in Montana or New Mexico or, or Wyoming or Colorado, mm-hmm. the Rocky somewhere in, in isolation with that, that feeling. Love that. We love the tools. We love inspiring people about them, but we also love places even ordinary places, like you said, could be in some nondescript river valley somewhere that it's not on any sort of tourist map, but you know about it and you, or you've discovered it. Um, I've got, you know, for the benefit of the listener, I've got a, one of my favorite scenes behind me in Western Colorado. It's not a place that's really on any sort of guidebook or, you know, Rick Steves or any other, you know, person that, you know, has written about cool places to visit. It's, it's important to me. It's, it's a place I love. The, the, the neat thing is that it's tied to our overall goal. We love places and, and natural places. We want to see them protected. And we see that geospatial empowerment of individuals with these tools can help protect these places so that right our kids, our grandkids, and future generations can actually enjoy these places. That's a, that's a great point. And actually, to, to that uh, point with me standing in the stream, it's actually not about catching the most fish for me or probably any fly fisherman. It's about standing there and feeling it. That's mm-hmm. what it is. Okay, Andres, thank you so much. So Andres Abeta, Executive Director of Boot Camp GIS. Uh, really appreciate you spending time running your own business and 
juggling all the thoughts and plans for the future that you must be doing on a daily basis. Really appreciate the time that you're spending with uh, these folks that are listening to this today. Awesome, Joseph. Great talking with you today. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.